This conference will now be recorded. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's great to have you with us again for our 18th uh, COVID-19 conference call. Uh, I think everybody knows me, but for those that don't, I'm Wayne Mitchell. I'm the president and CEO of the Nacogdoches County Chamber of Commerce. Uh, I want you to know that we're recording this call and that members of the media have been invited to participate on the call as well. Um, again, we I respectfully ask everyone to uh, put your phones and computers on mute until we're ready for questions. I would uh, want to remind you there's a wealth of information available at the Chamber website at www.nacogdoches.org. Please visit the COVID-19 resource page. We update that on a daily basis. And last week, it was a flurry of activity um, that we added into the website that you may want to you may want to take a look at. Um, we'll begin with our first presenter this morning. I'm pleased to add somebody to the call to provide us with the census information regarding Nacogdoches Memorial Hospital. Would you welcome board member Lisa King? Good morning, Lisa. Lisa might not have made it as yet, so maybe what we'll do is we'll we'll loop back. To Lisa, but I do see that we are pleased and fortunate to have the regional representative for Governor Greg Abbott on the line. Would you welcome Betty Rousseau, please? Good morning, Betty. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. Uh, there are a couple of uh, announcements that came out recently. Uh, the, I'm going to start with a good one. Uh, Texas was ranked best business climate in America in America by Business Facilities Magazine. Uh, the Texas, Governor Abbott says, Texas has built an unmatched economic environment that allows businesses to grow, innovate, and create more jobs for Texas workers. We have shown repeatedly that the Texas model of low taxes and smart regulations combined with our top-notch workforce is a winning formula for economic prosperity. And it goes on, but just to give you an idea, it's, it's, um, it's a pretty big honor that we've done that. So that's Larissa, pat yourself on the back. You were a part of that. Uh, Governor Abbott, Lieutenant Governor Patrick, Speaker Bonin, Chairman Taylor, Chairman Huberty released statement on school reopenings. Uh, the Texas Education Agency's guidance for opening public schools in Texas for the 2020 and 2021 school year remains the same as announced two weeks ago. This guidance followed a letter issued jointly by the governor, lieutenant governor, speaker, and chairs of the Senate and House Education Committee. Y'all may have already seen that, but just a reminder on that. Um, there today, Governor Abbott will receive a briefing on PPE in Texas. Uh, it, that'll be at 11 a.m. this morning. I don't have details as to where you can listen to it. We never get that until right before, so I apologize about that. But just to put a bug in your ear on that and a reminder that tomorrow the um, is the small business webinar it's business strategies for an evolving future it's at one o'clock i sent the registration link to kelly she has that if you're interested it's um, assistance for small businesses and i know they're going to have some big time speakers on it uh, i believe i'm going from memory here i think it's either ebay or um, one of the big tech companies is going to be one of the speakers, but there will also be others. But those are always very helpful webinars to listen in on. And that's it for my report. I appreciate it. And thank you for the time. Well, thank you very much. We appreciate that, uh, Betty. And it's great having you on the line. And uh, congratulations on uh, Texas's de designation for business climate. That's wonderful news. Um, I do see we are fortunate to have with us Senator Robert Nichols. Good morning, Senator. Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Oh, great. I've got, uh, like, uh, I do appreciate y'all doing this. I was on the line on a dial-in last week, uh, but when it came time to speak, uh, it didn't connect. So I apologize, but I want all of y'all to know that I was there and listened. Uh, I've got two or three things to go over. First, uh, I'll talk about some of the state's finance related. Uh, the July sales tax actually was up 4.3% over the same month last year, which is pretty amazing to me. 
when you take the three months or second quarter May, June, well, May, June, and July, uh, compared to last year, that one three month period, it was down 5.3. So it's really didn't hit our sales tax nearly as bad as a lot of us thought it was going to. And it seems like it's picking up. Uh, down the most, of course, was construction, restaurants, which I know you're going to talk about, and service industries. Uh, oil severance taxes last month, compared this past month, compared to a year ago, were down 40%. And that's, uh, natural gas was down 71%. So that's a pretty amazing uh, hit. Uh, the e-commerce sales tax uh, were up sharply compared to last year. Uh, some of y'all may remember 2018, the U.S. Supreme Court changed its previous position and said that we can collect in the state uh, internet sales coming in from outside of the state. And more and more uh, people um, are being connected into that. So that number is going up uh, pretty dramatically. Now, unfortunately, with the current rules, that sales tax goes to the communities that have the distribution centers. But the comptroller had a series of hearings around the state uh, to decide whether or not to put it into the local communities. Uh, in other words, if somebody from Nacogdoches orders by internet, should our argument was Nacogdoches should receive that sales tax. And so he changed the rules and beginning September 2021, it will be that money will be going to the origin of the order, which should be very beneficial to our East Texas communities. However, since that does not kick in to September 2021, just a little over a year ago, he did that intentionally to get one legislative session uh, to see if the legislature wants to agree with his rule or change it. So get ready for a legislative fight over that. The communities that have the big distribution centers are gonna be fighting uh, to keep that. Uh, we'll be fighting to leave the rules so the local community can get up. Um, comptroller last week, I believe it was the early part of last week, reported that our current budget, which is a two year budget, we're only about one year into it, was gonna be short by 4.6 billion. I'm on a work group in Senate Finance that really breaks all those numbers down. And I don't think that gives a clear picture of how bad it really is. When you break the numbers down, we were really down more like our lost revenues in our two year budget. We lost $11.5 billion. And by the way he only ended up with a negative 4.6 was we had left 4 billion in the budget. Uh, he counted 1.2 billion coming in from the feds and a number of other things. But the real revenue loss in this two year period uh, was uh, 11 and a half billion. So first thing we're gonna be looking at when we go to January, beginning January, is how do we come up with closing that gap just in the existing budget and then we're going to have to figure out with the estimated revenue how we're going to make things balance in the following one. And uh, I've been through a couple of those before in 2009, 2011, and it's not pretty. Uh, redistricting update. I'm on the redistricting uh, committee for the Senate. Uh, the feds are now telling us that the census numbers were as they last told us that we would not get them to June. Now we're not going to get them to sometime in July. They're supposed to get us the numbers in January uh, because of the COVID stuff. They just can't get it done. So whereas instead of doing redistricting in a normal regular session, we're going to be scattered out all summer and early fall. So the lieutenant governor told us in the Senate that do not plan any vacations before the end of September. So uh, if we get those numbers in September, We'll have special sessions for however long it takes to come up with those numbers. Texas is estimating to get, and y'all probably heard this, three congressional seats. But if nobody knows where those seats are going to be, that's part of what we've got to work out. And if you can imagine an open seat, like a congressional seat, nobody knows where it's going to be, uh, who's going to run for it? So once it's established and locked in place, 
you've got to only have a couple of months to put a team together and uh, file for uh, your primary. Um, also, some of the Senate committees doing our interim charges, that's the work we do in between sessions, or now starting to meet again, which I think is important, but we're doing all those in a virtual setting. And I was on one uh, this past week where we actually, the virtual meeting was in Corpus Christi of all places. I was wondering how that was gonna work, but they limited the call-ins only to that region. And I would tell you that it actually worked pretty well. It was a, one of the better meetings I had been in. Some of the uh, Region H uh, hospital information, since you, uh, I'm sure she'll be, look, somebody's gonna be getting on uh, pretty quick, but I got the latest from the state on Region H, which is Nacogdoches County, Angelina, and our immediate surrounding. Uh, we've got about 412 staff beds. Uh, we had 97 confirmed cases of COVID actually in the hospital, eight available ICU beds. Um, total beds available were 144, and we had 77 ventilators available. Uh, the total state tests to date are over 4 million. I like guess 4,143,000, which is absolutely amazing because when we started in March, uh, I think it was like 2,500 a week uh, in our uh, 22 county area. Uh, and studying the trends statewide, uh, I see a little bright spot on the horizon. The positivity rate, and always, I don't look at one day counts, I always follow the seven day trending uh, average, uh, uh, and the seven day trending average on positivity rate is 13.5%. I know that's high, but it was ranging around 15 to 16%, and it topped out at 17. So the positivity rate is actually starting to trend down a little bit. Uh, the fatality seven day average at, are, for the statewide are also trending down. So I think those are uh, something positive. Uh, that's really all I had to report unless somebody wants to ask me a question. Thank you, Senator Nichols. Any questions of Senator Nichols? Senator, thank you very much for that. We really appreciate it. Uh, is uh, uh, represent, Representative Clardy online? Wayne, this is Jerry Jones in Representative Clardy's office. He is traveling. I expect him to be on the call, but he may not. Not sure. Okay, uh, Jerry, well, we'll accommodate him. I don't think Lisa King has joined us again. Well, good. We'll move on. Uh, I, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Larissa Philpot, President and uh, CEO of the Nacogdoches Economic Development Corporation. Good morning, Larissa. Hey, um, coming to you live from Amy Mahaffey's office over here at the Rec Center today. Um, we're going to tag team this one. Um, I just have a few little announcements, things to keep your eyes open for. Um, we're working, Nedco is working with Commercial Bank to um, promote a webinar about financial survival for small businesses during COVID. Um, this will include things like how to maximize your um, P3 lo loan repayment um, or forgiveness, sorry, not repayment. Um, and then anything that we expect to come out of um, any new federal stimulus bills here, hopefully in the next two or three weeks. Um, so keep an eye on that, and thanks to Commercial Bank for volunteering to do that for us. We'll start promoting that on social media and with the paper and KTRE soon. Um, and then also we are working with the City of Nacogdoches Finance Department on CARES Act, um, possible economic stimulus funding. Um, the city has allocated a certain amount of money through the CARES Act. Some of that money is utilized for local response to COVID-19, and then some of that we are able to develop some economic stimulus programming. Um, and so we're excited to be able to do that. It's a lot of moving parts and pieces and a lot of red tape to, to make it through first. So um, just give us some time and hopefully um, maybe next week we'll be able to announce that programming. And that is all I have. Thank you. And I'll throw it over to Amy if that's okay, Wayne. 
He was muted. I think you're muted, Wayne. I apologize for that. Amy, would you like to give your report now? And thank you, Larissa. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate y'all having me on again. Um, we, I guess the state was updating their big dashboard over the weekend. And so there's a little bit of a delay in our case updates that come from the state, but um, we expect to get those this week. Um, we had a couple of, of days last week that were pretty high. Um, I just want to remind you that we every Tuesday release um, our what I call like our, our uh, curves and our trend lines. Um, they are very um, important because they look at the moving average of 7, 14, and 21 days. So instead of looking at a snapshot of one day where we may have had a bunch of cases and then the next day it was a little bit more normalized. Um, this allows us to kind of track that those trends. And so that's super important. Um, we release those every Tuesday. We're also going to start releasing um, our positivity rate. And so you'll start to see that, you know, we have more cases, but we're also testing more. And you hear that a lot, but we'll have that information kind of visualized for people because, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. And then um, you may have noticed on our dashboard, we've updated um, with the zip code, a zip code map. And so that will, it's a little bit skewed because there are um, long-term care facilities and certain zip codes. And so you kind of have to keep that in mind, but it's still a really good visual snapshot at any given time of how, how the community looks. Um, I just want to encourage everybody to continue um, to, to, to educate your circle. So if folks in your circle that you visit with uh, maybe have some misinformation, um, I just want everybody to feel empowered to continue um, to push them to the emergency management site or the city's website so that um, everybody has the correct and accurate information at any given time. Uh, this is an ever evolving situation. And so having um, trusted sources and people um, like the folks at the county emergency management um, department that that work on this day in and day out um, with to try to get the accurate information. Um, it's important that that gets distributed far and wide. So if there aren't any questions, that is my report, Mr. Mitchell. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahaffey. Any questions of Amy or Larissa? If not, we'll move on. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, Les, are you on the line by chance, Les Lambarger? He'll be on in just a little bit. He's in cabinet and he said he would hop on in a little bit if there's a spot for him when he's through. We'll make a spot for him. That's not a problem at all. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Sherry Morgan from the Convention and Visitors Bureau, our director. Good morning, Sherry. Hello. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Let me pull my notes over. Uh, hotel occupancy tax is down 39.8% for the month of June, 40.2% year to date, and 45.2% for the last running 12 months. And as a reminder, the CVB is fully funded through this tax. So when it's down, our revenue is down and our ability to market is drastically affected. Um, despite that, this last weekend, we had a really successful sale on the trail, um, which is a sales event that um, starts in Natchitoches and runs all the way along the El Camino Real through Nacogdoches. Uh, that was very successful this weekend. So we hope that our um, sales tax reflects that. When those numbers come in, we saw um, we're still having a really steady stream of visitors come through the visitor center, um, as well as a steady stream of requests for information from the internet of people that are um, wanting to come and get more information to Nacogdoches to plan a visit in the future. When something dramatically changes or ends, it's really easy to fall into a trap of believing that things will never be the same or as good as they once were and to grieve it as a loss and consequently get stuck in a rut of loss mentality. But if we can manage to move from grief to a place where we can release what was with joy and with thanks for the time that we enjoyed it, 
we open ourselves up to a reasonable expectation that what is to come is greater than what we once had. Tourism everywhere is never going to look or feel the same again. And the same holds true here in Nacogdoches. And that's okay. Great replaces good. It always has and it always will. So what we can do now is we can look, um, our industry is really great at doing these traveler sentiment surveys so that we can keep a pulse point on how people are thinking and feeling in regards to travel. And the most recent one indicates that 67% of our traditional market still doesn't feel safe traveling. And 80% of all those surveyed feel very strongly that masks should be worn as a safety precaution, both as residents welcoming new people into their community and as uh, visitors to communities, they're looking for that assurance that that destination that they've chosen to visit is taking the pandemic seriously in a very visible demonstrative way. 44% of those surveys uh, will feel more comfortable traveling if and when a vaccine is becoming available. And so the same uh, traveler sentiment survey that tells us that people are not coming also highlights that there are demographic groups that still that feel comfortable traveling and specifically the is uh, millennials and gen z they're still comfortable and so we are now shifting our focus to a different target audience while still holding a place for our tried and true friends uh, we typically operate on a 90 day out marketing plan so our focus now is again on that new target audience of a younger demographic and promoting what promises to be a really outstanding and beautiful fall foliage season um, and whatever Christmas is going to look like this year. So we remain hopefully optimistic. Um, and again, we're just, it's kind of like selling your house. Um, you know, you know that you're going to have a potential buyer come through uh, any moment. And so you have to be ready <laughs> to sort of keep your house clean. So we're doing our best to get the message out there to responsibly promote uh, travel and visiting um, in, to Nacogdoches and I'm here to welcome people when they do come. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. And uh, your industry uh, sadly has been impacted uh, so severely by this. I think everybody's is praying that uh, we get back to a to a, a, a quick recovery for those folks. Uh, I do want to let you folks know that next week we're going to be uh, uh, our featured presenter tomorrow. Uh, next week will be uh, Mr. Scott Jos Josleff, who is the president and CEO of the Texas Hotel and Lodging Association. And Scott's organization is the largest hotel association in the United States. So it'll be interesting to to have him as a part of. Uh, as have him a part to kind of update us so that our hotel operators can get a sense of what the trends are here in Texas and in the United States. I do see that Lisa King has joined us. Lisa, would you like to give us a, a, a quick update on Memorial and the census? Lisa, your mic might be on mute. Well, if Lisa's not uh, available to hook in, hopefully she will be shortly. We'll go to Gary Lee Ashcraft. Good morning, Gary Lee. Morning, everybody. Uh, we're uh, getting a little enthused and excited around here, and this will be real quick. Uh, only going to talk about the 2021 campaign. What we raise uh, or get pledged this year goes for next year. There's been a little trepidation about that, how that would look. Uh, we've pretty much got our campaign now in place. Uh, mechanically. Uh, it will be a hybrid uh, virtual campaign. It depends on the uh, coordinator of the campaign for each of the companies. Uh, we have a special thing to do with the small business uh, groups called High Five. Um, I'll explain that some other time, uh, but it's, it'll be fun and exciting and it'll, it'll give uh, uh, the smaller businesses an opportunity at a very reasonable level uh, to participate. Uh, feedback we're getting uh, from uh, our campaign, we're contacting them in a 
uh, uh, United Way Blast, we call it, next week. Uh, we have about uh, 20 people that are going to be calling some of y'all uh, to talk to you about campaigning with us. Uh, we're, we're getting good feedback. People are saying we know that uh, it's important this year more than ever to support the United Way financially uh, because they know that that money is going to pass right through us and hold up uh, our agencies primarily uh, to uh, uh, keep them going on what they do. We have uh, 16 agencies we will fund next, uh, next uh, year. Uh, and uh, we're funding heavily toward those agencies that are most involved uh, with keeping people uh, healthy and safe and, and working and, and what have you. So it uh, uh, looks like we're, we're real busy right now, but it looks like it's going to be a successful campaign. So I tell you all to live united and thank you for supporting us. Gary Lee, how are your support agencies doing? Well, we uh, uh, a while back we had raised uh, oh somewhere in the neighborhood of twenty eight thousand dollars in what we call a COVID uh, fund specifically for the agencies. Four of the agencies applied for that, uh, and uh, their shortfalls were uh, really severe uh, because of the fact that they're uh, spending more resources right now. Boys and Girls Club was was one I'll point out. I don't think Steve would mind. Uh, but they're they're working hard to feed families and kids. Solid Foundation, same uh, deal. Helping House, uh, uh, the, the, those were three. Senior Center, uh, their Meals on Wheels program uh, was running short of funding. They have no events this year. All the events that are primary fundraisers have been canceled. Uh, on that note, uh, we'll do the Turkey Trot. It may be done virtually. Uh, and we're not talking about the Christmas parade until a little bit later. We're, we're kind of holding on that one. But those, uh, for the most part, and talking to all the agency leaders, they're, they're just keeping on, keeping on, and, and doing well. We haven't lost one to COVID yet. Uh, but the $28,000 we divided into four, uh, no one ever calls this office. I don't know what's going on. Uh, we divided in four uh, uh, $7,000 payments, and they were well received uh, by those folks. Well, thank you, Gary. We'll let you get that phone call so you can uh, cash that check. So there you go. Uh, I do know Lisa King has joined us. Lisa, good morning. You want to give us an idea of the census? We appreciate your addition to the call. Sure. Good morning. It's been uh, a Tuesday morning, hadn't it, everybody? Um, I'm looking forward to the end of spring break next week. Um, as of this morning, we have uh, 17 patients in the hospital with positive COVID diagnosis. Plus, we also have an additional seven uh, that are admitted to uh, our COVID unit that we're waiting to get test results back on. So there's currently five in the ICU. Uh, we only have one on a ventilator. We have 10 ventilators available. We've got five patients in our COVID rehab have unit, which is really encouraging. So right here, right now, today, the acuity level of the COVID patients um, that we're treating is a little more manageable. So there's a little bit of hope looking at things today. I'm sure you all saw the, uh, the ventilator hood uh, unit that uh, Dr. Hashim had on the news last night. And I've had people ask me about that. And that's for patients that need that positive pressure ventilation in their lungs, but we're not quite ready to put them actually on a full-blown ventilator when you have to, you know, paralyze people and, and take away their ability to talk, to eat, to communicate in any way with people. So, um, so far we're having good results with that and uh, hoping that we can just use that instead of having to go uh, all the way to ventilators. So things are looking a little bit better. I don't wanna be cautiously optimistic and jinx it, but right now the acuity level of the patients that we have um, are not as severe as they were even last week. Well, that's, uh, that's a great report, Lisa. We appreciate that. And uh, obviously we're praying for you and the staff at Memorial and Medical Center and, and our other medical facilities around town uh, to hopefully keep that uh, keep that going. I'm I, I, to just go ahead. Yeah, I, I, no, I was just gonna say I appreciate that and 
and uh, you know, I'm a nurse. I've been a nurse for a long time. I have not had to work the COVID unit, but one of my friends uh, did a little thing, a little talk, talking about how way back when all this started, March, April, May, healthcare people, every day you heard stuff on the news about, yay, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, we're still in it, knee deep like we were, and uh, we just appreciate any uh, public support that we can get because, uh, you know, people know how difficult, well, they don't know how difficult this job is, but but people realize the necessity and the importance of this job. And the nurses, respiratory therapists, physicians, everybody are very taxed. We do have state nurses that have come in to help support us, which is fabulous. Um, so we're, we're just cautiously optimistic and very appreciative of everything the community's done for us at this point. Well, thank you, Lisa, for that report. We really appreciate that. It's my uh, pleasure to introduce one of my Nacogdoches heroes for the purpose of introduction this morning. Um, appropriately, she is a leading restaurateur here in Nacogdoches. Uh, she's a past uh, chairman of the board here at the Chamber of Commerce. She leads our government relations program as it relates to our visits to uh, to, uh, to Austin uh, every other year and our LSLS program, which sadly was canceled this year. Would you pl please welcome with me uh, our former chair, uh, Donna Finley. Good morning, Donna. Good morning, Wayne. This morning, I am pleased to introduce Dr. Emily Williams Knight, CEO of the Texas Restaurant Association and Education Foundation since August 1st, 2019. I feel like she is a close personal friend since I get a, an email or a video chat from her most days. Dr. Knight holds a doctorate in higher education leadership from Walden University, an honorary doctorate of humane letters from Newburgh College, a master's of science in management from Troy University, a bachelor of science from Boston University where she was a trustee scholar and an associate degree in Hotel and Restaurant Administration from Newberry College, where she was a presidential scholar and captain of the women's basketball team. Dr. Knight was recruited by Pizza Hut's management directly out of college and served as a catering and event manager for Marriott's Key West Resorts. Dr. Knight served as, Manning, as a managing director of higher education North American at Study Group, a leader provider of international university education. Her career includes senior leadership roles at Marriott and serving as president of Kendall College. Dr. Knott led student recruitment for two of the top five hospital hospitality schools in the world, in the world, which were located in Switzerland. Dr. Knott is a member of the National Restaurant Association Educational Foundation where she serves on the Finance and Audit and Executive Committees. She serves on the Texas Travel and Tourism Board and the Texas Business Roundtable. She is adjunct faculty member at Southern New Hampshire University, teaching courses in international business, management, leadership, and consumer marketing. Dr. Knight lives with her husband and their 14-year-old twins in South Lake, Texas. And I wish I had some of her energy to rub off on me because I mean I'm just she's just an amazing person. Thank you, Emily. Oh, Donna, thank you. Can y'all hear me okay? Great. Um, thank you so much, and and thank you for that introduction. I mean, it, it's hard to believe what life was like before the middle of March um, because we've been living in this crisis, and 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 I, mean, I think as Donna shared, everything has changed for us in the sector, and so I thought if I just had a couple of minutes to give you an update on kind of where we are, but also just take you back a little bit to that second week of March when um, I received a call from the governor's office. If you remember, we were slowly closing different communities around the state dining rooms, um, but nothing had been fully closed and with 254 counties. Um, it was very difficult for a lot of the large chains, but even independents to think about what tomorrow was gonna bring because there was just no clarity. Um, once we were really officially, those dining rooms were closed. If you think about it, overnight, our 50,000 restaurants had to change their business models. And so if they had the good fortune of having a drive through um, that helped them immediately because they could still serve customers. But everyone else had to move to curbside, to delivery, to takeout. 
Um, and so the association just really went into full force partnership with the governor and his team and, and you know, did curbside alcohol to go. So if you pick up your food now and you get alcohol uh, with that, uh, you can thank the TRA because um, it's amazing of all the things we've accomplished. That seems to be one that gets a lot of attention from people. But um, we were trying to think about how to generate revenue, right, for these institutions that were going to just struggle. Um, and at the time, if you remember, we thought it would be about Easter when we'd be back and everything would be normal again. Um, and we're, we're sort of anything but normal. Um, you know, we did a retail to go waiver where we became essentially mini grocery stores in our communities across the state. We then went back and, and had the ability to do mixed drinks to go. Uh, worked on the federal front very aggressively, something the state association doesn't typically get into. We have an entire team in DC, uh, but we actually worked with our legislators here and between the Paycheck Protection Program and then Congressman Roy, myself and Phillips drafted a bill, which was that Flexibility Act that got passed, um, which I like to say minus one member on both sides federally that didn't vote for it, um, but that actually extended that use of money. And so we've sort of been in this very much survival reimagining how to generate revenue and keep people employed. But the net result is as we stepped into July, we have about 600,000 employees that are still on the sidelines. We've lost about 15% of our restaurants. Our independents are the most concerning for us because they don't have the liquidity or access to capital that a large chain would. They also employ local, they are local. Some of these folks have been in business 30, 40, 50 years. You know, I argue we can't afford to lose that sense of community. So we are working very hard on a couple of things as we've stepped into August. One, I just messaged with the governor's strike force this morning, asking for a number of changes now that we're two, almost two and a half weeks of some positive trending numbers, um, trying to get us to 75% capacity. But most importantly, it's that social distancing inside restaurants that have become very challenged. So you can get us to 100%, but if you still need six feet per table, you're not gonna see restaurants be able to add any capacity. Uh, single use menus, buffets are still closed. They're open in many states. And so we've gone back this morning to make very clear, we, we'll keep being great citizens as restaurants, but get these things for us. And then next week, let's look at that additional capacity if the numbers continue. On the federal front, I have to say it's, uh, and Donna knows I'm very direct in my messages to members at night. I'm just beyond disappointed. You know, we are in Washington right now with people we've elected and they're literally just trying to figure out who can win whatever game it is they're playing. And in the middle of this are small business owners that are struggling to survive and whether it be liability protection, tax credits, an extension of that PPP for a sequel, a second round of funding. Um, all of this is tied up, unemployment benefits expiring, all that's tied up and just sort of this deadlock. And we have until the seventh. And so as an association, you know, we are trying to get everyone here open, but we also know that even getting people further opened isn't going to make a difference if we can't get additional relief and support. And then, you know, on the, the back end of this is, believe it or not, we've just hired our lobby team to support myself, obviously, who's a lobbyist to go to, you know, the Capitol next spring. It's going to look really different. We might not be able to get in. You know, we saw the leaked rules, essentially, um, and it's going to be a very different session. But we know that a lot of the good work we've done with the governor on the executive orders, we need to solidify. And we also need to get additional relief in the form of tax or other regulatory measures that we've identified that will work very hard on next spring. Um, if you think about any sector, I just like to remind everyone as I close out my remarks is we are the hardest hit in the nation. We still have 6 million unemployed Americans. We're 47% minority in our workforce and we cannot afford to keep these people on the sidelines. And so if you're not eating out, please eat out. If you don't feel comfortable, eat outside. And if you don't feel comfortable doing either of those, then please get takeout or curbside or most importantly, buy a gift card and don't use it. Hold it for later and give that local restaurant. And I was looking this morning on your chamber page, you've got some great local restaurants that I know could really use your support. And so whatever you can do now, uh, we're losing too many, and we need to do everything we can as a community right now to keep them open. So happy to answer any questions, if that's helpful, or Donna, if there's something I missed, but I wish I had a better news story. Um, it's just, it, it's it's pretty terrible. Someone said to me this morning, it's like being in the ocean and you're knocked down, if you've ever been knocked down by a wave, and the minute you stand up, the next one hits you, and that's sort of what it feels like for restaurants, because even down in your area, maybe even further, we just had you know, further south, we had, of course, down in the McAllen area, the hurricane 
product prices and food prices have skyrocketed and, you know, sort of add all that up and you wonder why restaurant owners are so resilient because you sort of have to be to be in this business. Thank you, Dr. Knight. Any questions for Dr. Knight? Yes, Wayne, I would like to ask one, please. This is Donna from uh, KTRE Television. Um, I appreciate what you're trying to do as far as, you know, open up some buffets, go to 75% to 100%. But what are some new directions that restaurants are taking or can take to build that public confidence to come back and eat out? Yeah, it's, a, it's such a great question. You know, we were one of the only organizations, and I'll sort of mention two things, right? One is there was a lot of narrative about six weeks ago when the numbers started to trend up. It was about the middle of June, so longer than that now. Um, and restaurants became a very easy target. Um, there's no evidence that restaurants caused the spread of COVID, not a single data point. Um, in fact, on Friday, when Maryland's governor paused their opening, he had two slides in his press deck. The first slide was contact tracing data, and it showed that family gatherings, outdoor gatherings and barbecues were where the spread was coming from. And on the second slide was that less than 23% of people had actually dined in a restaurant. And clearly those 23% did not get it from the contact tracing data. So the more contact tracing and the more data we have, the more we know that restaurants are not the cause of COVID. Frankly, they're the most regulated from the health departments in the entire state of where you can go to be safe. We know that the public narrative and, and, and honestly, the media did not do a, a good service when this first started. It was very easy to find every single case of COVID, track it to a restaurant, or if a restaurant had an employee that had COVID, they would spotlight that across the news, right? And that's incredibly unfair because restaurants were going above and beyond what was required to keep people safe. And so we have sort of two components of this um, because you're exactly right, Donna, the question about how do you build trust? First is we have the restaurant promise, which we built long before we were opened with the USDA, the FDA, and we hope every restaurant has that in their window. And that's mirrors Governor Abbott's health protocols. But we took it one step further about a month ago. We partnered with Dallas College. We got a significant grant from the Texas Workforce Commission and we built a certification program for restaurants. So their employees can go through at no cost funded by the state. They get a certification, but where it's different is that the difference is there's a third party we've hired that will go in and over four different visits will evaluate the right things are happening in order for that restaurant to hang that certification in the window. And that third party validation we think is everything. But at the same time, you know, it's the public narrative that's very difficult to manage in a world of social media, and there's a lot of fear. And so we tell people, as you go out and have a great experience, share that experience. And that comfort, when we see the numbers, we've seen this last week, both air travel and restaurants. Air travel, I think, was up 23% across the U.S., and we saw restaurants start to recover slightly, nowhere near enough. But a lot of that is the numbers have come down dramatically across the state, and so there's less fear um, because we're not hearing about it every six minutes. And so wear your mask, do your part, go for restaurants that have that certification um, and you should be in great shape. But I believe as an association and as a restaurant industry, we've gone above and beyond to make sure that people have that comfort and it's gonna take time. It is gonna take time. We just hope not too much time. Thank you so much for those comments. Just, I'm curious during your travels, what did you see or what have you seen as the most innovative and imaginative way to attract a customer into the building? Yeah, I think, you know, it's giving people choice, right? So it's saying you love our food. So if you want to come in, come in and have a great experience. If and we meet the health protocols, right? If you want to dine out, then dine out. These boxes to go, these almost farm boxes, which we're going to try to legislatively put into place is, you know, come and get your raw meat, your steak maybe, and all the fixings, and then get your bottle of wine and take that box to go for $50. We'll put it in your car, off you go. So what we see restaurants doing is meeting the consumer where they are today. And that's how a restaurant can be really successful. Um, and, and remember, restaurants are on a paradigm. So if you're at a Chick-fil-A right now and you can have two drive through or maybe a third drive through lane and you've got a 10 over it and you are just humming through, right? They haven't seen the impact of a small mom and pop restaurant that has 25 tables, 12 have been removed because of social distancing. They don't have a drive through window. Delivery companies are taking, you know, 25% of the order. So everything's unprofitable. That middle section is the one that we're most concerned about. That's the one that's most vulnerable right now. So creativity and meeting the consumer where they are have become so important for restaurant survival. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Wayne. 
Thank you for the question, Donna. Any other questions for, for Dr. Knight? Hey, Wayne, um, I do. This is Cassandra. And for those of you that don't know, Cassandra is another one of our extraordinary restaurateurs here in Nacogdoches, owner of Nukes. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, I just want to say thanks for representing us, uh, uh, for all the restaurant owners. This is an incredibly difficult time for us, and re we really appreciate everything that everyone is doing uh, to help all businesses. Um, so my deal is I own uh, several restaurants across uh, East Texas, and because of social distancing, we'll never be able to uh, have our dining rooms open more than 50%. Uh, so it doesn't matter, you know, 75% or anything above that, we're stuck at 50%. So for us, uh, when our first injection of PPP money uh, runs out, which is due to, for me personally, in about four weeks, we'll, we'll need that second injection. But uh, currently, the way it's uh, they're trying to pass it, uh, you have to be down 50 percent over uh, the first or second quarter from the prior year. That's still going to put me out of business, um, unfortunately, uh, because I uh, have two restaurants that are below that threshold, but I have one that's above the 50 percent. And, and it's uh, it's about down 32 percent right now. And so, um, but as you know, we can't uh, change our non-controllables and things like that. The bills just keep coming in. Plus yep. we've been trying to put off bills. Um, are, are you guys actively uh, looking at that 50% or is that something that they've kind of passed over as far as gross sales go? Yeah, no, super timely. And I'm sure if Donna saw my note last night, there are two big issues in this package that we've targeted. The first is, and I hope you either already know this, and if you don't, please, I don't want to be the one to add to the pain, but the current PPP money you received is taxable. So that is a huge oversight. It was not the intention of the bill when it was passed, but Secretary Mnuchin is holding firm. That means if you think about it, right, and this is just makes it just sound even worse, but if I used money and kept people on the books, even though I wasn't generating revenue, which was the intent of PPP, right, Paycheck Protection Program, um, I would now have to pay tax on that. That's insane, right? So that's one issue we're tackling, and we've actually got folks, including Congressman Brady, and our own Senator Cornyn now has a bill to fix that, right? So that's huge. We have to fix that for every business owner, because if you took out a $2 million loan and you have to pay tax on that now, and you spent that money while not generating additional income, you're going to be in trouble. So that's one piece. The second piece is the 50%. Two things are happening. About a week ago, I asked our members to send me an email with what their losses were because I knew that 50% was far too high. And here's why it's too high. The 50% is one thing. The problem is they're measuring it as quarter one or quarter two. States like Texas that open May 1st are gonna be penalized. If you're sitting in New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, California, Oregon, Washington, et cetera, you probably will get to 50% because your dining rooms still, still are not even open. Well, we opened ours on May 1. So we had this, remember this huge fall of nothing, started to climb back out in May, by mid-June fell again. You can see it very clearly. So our, we have two issues. One is you should be able to pick the three consecutive months out of that six month window for you to be able to, you know, that's your measurement period. And two, we had Congressman Roy fill a bill, it came out on Friday afternoon at a 20% threshold. We think, to be honest, Cassandra, it's going to end up potentially at 30%. So we sent out last night a call to action federally um, that I'm happy to send to you when this is over, but it's to, you know, again, hit our con congressional district with the fact that we need it to be lowered from 50%. So those are our two very key issues right now in this whole plan. Liability looks like it'll come through and liability protection is gonna matter for all of you. Um, and then also the um, unemployment should come to fruition by Friday. Sometime. But those two, you're absolutely right. And we are very interested in those discussions. Thank you so much. 30% uh, is actually what I told my banker as well. So, uh, so I, yeah. I, at least I feel good about what I, I thought as well. And so yeah. um, thank you because um, my other thing would be uh, the unemployment. Um, we need workers. We're not able to get workers to apply because they are getting that extra unemployment. And, and it's been difficult to try to even get some of our current employees that we reduce their hours. 
um, but yet we're trying to give them full hours and they won't take the full hours, but yet they're not coming right out and saying it. What they're doing is changing their availability or they're calling out or they're, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that they're doing in order to stay on that unemployment. And so we're unable to, to staff the restaurants properly. And so we're all, we're all very concerned about um, the benefits of unemployment and how that ends up going as well. Yeah, and it's a shame it fell off a cliff on Friday because it's disappointing they couldn't come to some type of scale down um, because two things are going to happen. We now have 32 million Americans that don't have the extra 2400 a month, which will impact restaurants um, because we're discretionary spend in some cases, even at 51% of the food dollars. So that's painful and going to be immediate, right, an economic impact. The other side is now we have all these folks that are going to be clamoring to come back to work and we don't have the hours because we have the government caps in place and we can't generate the kind of business we did. It's this incredibly vicious circle um, that is, at the end result, super painful for restaurants. We lose on both sides of this. And so we've been positioning a scale down. So go back to work and get down to 200 a week and then 100 a week and by third month, but you've gotta be full-time employed or in a job share program. I think the challenge is, I have to be honest, I never imagined this would expire at midnight Friday. I really somehow thought a unicorn was gonna come out I just cannot believe that they, that, that they just stopped. And so all these, I mean, 32 million Americans are still unemployed from COVID and that extra money is now gone. And, and as you said, very important for all small businesses, you renegotiated your rent, you deferred payments. Now all of that is coming due as well. And so without that second round of paycheck protection, it's gonna be really hard for most small businesses to get through this window. And so that's why this is just such a, like I said, I never imagined being so engaged federally, but when we put that flexibility act in place that passed to allow people to use it longer, I saw the power of getting, especially in Texas, our delegation aligned and two freshman congressmen and a brand new CEO got that done. So I'm not gonna give up until we get it. It's just a relentless fight right now to stay on the radar and for people to know that you've got five plus million people out of work and you have a chance to lose what percentage of businesses across the US, probably 30% of the restaurants, second biggest employer, um, that is gonna hurt the economy guys if we don't fix it. So Cassandra, I, we've got tons of energy around this and you know, let's just everyone pray. And if you've got your elected officials and I'm happy to send you our call to action, it's you put your zip code in and it emails who's tied to you and it says, essentially hashtag do your job, right? Like we elected you, you're sitting in Washington, do your job. Because if you don't, a lot of small businesses are gonna fail. Thank you. Of course, thank and you. Dr. Knight, if you'll send us that information as well, we'll disseminate it to our membership. Uh, I, put, I made a note for our advocacy committee that we need to weigh in with Senator Cornyn on the PVP uh, yes. issue that you, you just raised as well. And we'll, We'll make sure our voice is into both our, our House members and Senate members as well. I Excellent. hope I want to thank you again for joining us today. Um, you, you've added uh, an enormous amount of valuable information to our uh, our call, and uh, we very much appreciate that. And I hope you and and the Texas Restaurant Association will feel free to call on the Nacogdoches Chamber and any of our partners on this phone if we can assist you in any way. Uh, we're all rooting for you because we've all got so much at stake. Absolutely. And I'll send you my email as well. And you're happy to send it out to your members. And if we can be helpful or you have local issues, please call us directly because, you know, we, we, we need to get through this together. So thanks for having me. And um, I appreciate the time. Thank you, Dr. Knight. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Take care. Great. Uh, and uh, last, uh, Dr. Knight, you, I hope you feel free to stay on the call. We, we've got a couple more reports. Les Leinbarger, good morning. Good morning, Wayne. Uh, thank you for having me on. It's good to see everyone. Uh, beginning tomorrow, all NISD teachers report for staff development ahead of the start of a new school year. You may have already seen this, but last week, NISD's Board of Trustees adopted an updated calendar for the 2020-2021 academic year, pushing back the start date to August 31st. The calendar change provides teachers with an additional week to prepare for the start of school. The district will begin the school year with four weeks of virtual instruction, but during that time, the district will begin slowly and safely phasing in some students for on-campus instruction. Now, while much of the district's normal operations have been curtailed since March, construction projects have moved ahead as scheduled. Later this week, 
staff will begin moving into the new NISD Transportation Center located adjacent to the high school. Regrettably, we can't hold a ribbon cutting right now, but we're working on a video to introduce this new facility to the community. Please watch our website and social media accounts for more on this. The renovated and enlarged transportation center is the first major project paid for by the 2018 bond election that is coming to completion. Elsewhere around the district, other bond related construction is well underway. At the new Emmeline Carpenter Elementary, located on Southeast Stallings Drive, crews have nearly completed pouring the foundation for the campus. And there's already been a lot of cement poured at this site, including a long stretch of the driveway that will extend from East Main Street and serve as the main entrance and exit for parents. Across from the new Carpenter campus at McMichael Middle School, work on the classroom addition is underway on the north and east sides of the building. Once complete, all middle school students in NISD will attend McMichael, while the Mike Moses facility on Park Street will be converted to an elementary campus. At Nacogdoches High School, work is started on the Career and Technical Center that is on the south side of the school facing Moroni Drive. There's already been cement poured there for a new parking area located on the east side of that building. Guys, we're exceedingly grateful for the support voters showed the district back in 2018, and this Chamber of Commerce was instrumental in passage of that bond, and we're now beginning to see the new facilities take shape. That successful bond election will change the physical face of Nacogdoches ISD for the coming years. Wayne, that's all I've got. Thank you, Les. Any questions of Les? Les, I see that construction going on as I pass the high school coming and going to work every day. And it's uh, it's really great to see how fast they're moving along on that expansion at the high school. So congratulations. It's exciting times and we're, uh, we're just eternally grateful to the support we got from the community to allow us to do this. Great, thank you, Les. Any other reports this morning? If not, I will conclude this call by saying, uh, first of all, I, was, I want to thank once again, Dr. Knight for joining us. Thank you, Donna, for that introduction. We really appreciate that. And, uh, and, and we're rooting, we have several restaurateurs on the phone today. And Cassandra, your questions were extraordinarily insightful and, uh, and helpful in helping those of us that are less familiar with the challenges you're experiencing. Um, I really appreciate your willingness to, to ask those questions so we can all learn uh, how we can help this industry recover. And thank you, all of you, for your reports today. And we'll, again, next week, we'll have Scott Josleff, who is the president and CEO of the Texas Hotel and Lodging Association. And we'll be contacting all of our hotel operators, letting them know that uh, uh, he'll be online with us. And we hope you all have a very safe, healthy, and prosperous week. Thank you very much. <laughs>